Good morning, everyone, if you are in the UK, and welcome to the third and final day of the conference. Thank you for logging in this morning, and I hope you've enjoyed the previous sessions of this online event. Before we begin, I'm just going to run through some housekeeping notes with you. Please remember to have your video and microphones on mute throughout the presentation. In order to post a question to the speakers, please type it in the chat box, and we will try to answer those at the Q&A session at the end of this morning's session. A recording and a copy of the slides will be made available in the next few days. I'd like to start off by thanking our supporters for this event. Aptly, we have supporters from all around the world, including SCL Peru and SCL Vietnam, SICA, the Confederation of International Contractor Associations, the Development Bureau in Hong Kong, as well as professional and government bodies based here in the UK. So we welcome our supporters and all our delegates from all over the world this morning. I think it really shows how NEC is increasingly being used and gaining interest worldwide. We also have some exciting updates from the user group team to share with you. To accommodate this new online world, we now have made the membership offering global with four levels of corporate memberships, which anyone from any organization in the world can join, as well as a new grade for individuals and affiliate bodies. For any more information about the new levels, please email the user group team at NEC. We will also be launching an app, which will be exclusive to the users group members, and this will serve as an information hub for NEC content and allow you to interact with each other through its messaging service and stay up to date with news through notifications. And that will be launched at the beginning of July, so watch out for it. As an additional thank you for attending, we're offering all our delegates complimentary digital copy of our new FM contract. Those were attached to your joining instructions that were sent out as a time step PDF, which will expire on the 30th of September. Now, Today we will be starting a section with the famous NEC Awards, a process that I've had the pleasure of judging this year. The applications were very strong this year. It was an easy job to judge, but it's a really good way of showcasing the excellence in project delivery around the world and how NEC has been used to achieve that. And what we'll be doing next is watching a pre-recorded presentation for Mr. Lam, the Asia Pacific Users Group Chair and Permanent Secretary Works of the Hong Kong Development Bureau, Bureau. on the NEC use in Hong Kong. And that's going to be followed by a talk from Ian Staking from Square, Square Kilometer Array. I think if anybody has not muted the microphones, that will help. And finally, a co delivered presentation from NEC and the DBRF on the business and practices. So now it's probably a good time to watch the NEC award ceremony and the pre recorded presentation. Congratulations to everyone that entered especially those that have been recognized in these awards. It was a very high standard this year, and it was great to see that mutual trust and cooperation is being applied around the world to great success. The NEC has gone from strength to strength, and I was truly blown away by the quality of this year's mission all around the world. Um, and it's impressive to see um, a first-rate set of entries. This year in particular, uh, you gave the judges much to think about. Uh, the quality was excellent uh, with the collaborative aspects, the risk reduction and the principles of good project management truly shining out. Congratulations. Congratulations. The submissions this year have covered a wonderful project. It's been really impressive. What I enjoyed seeing was that all the entries started from the same place, implementing the collaborative ethos that underlies NEC and applying it in practice to speak to each other and discuss how they can improve delivery. And building on this platform, each project came up with the specific solutions that worked for their project, whether it was to do with contract processes, technology or sustainability. 
I hope that people will learn from those projects and build on that experience. Hi, everyone. It is a great honor for us to receive the NEC Transport Project of the Year Award 2021. On behalf of the project team, I would like to thank the NEC Users Group for the recognition of our efforts. The award is a great encouragement to us, and it is definitely a motivation for us to strive for further achievements under our NEC Option C contract. As the employer's representative of this project, I wish to extend my special thanks to our supervisor, AECOM Asia Company Limited, our contractor, China Railway, China Railway First Group, Zhenhua Engineering, John Venture, and of course, also to my colleagues in the Civil Engineering and Development Department of the Hong Kong SAR government. With the mutual trust and cooperation already built up among the project team members, I am confident that we can overcome all the challenges and hurdles in the future and achieve successful completion of the project. Yes. DSD of the Hong Kong SAL government aspires to provide a world-class sewer treatment facility in Shek Wu Ho. Its close proximity to local residences, as well as the complex interfaces between civil and ENM works within a congested environment, pose great challenges to the project team. The NEC framework, as well as the use of innovative technologies such as BIM and blockchain. A wide and versatile platform to support our collaborative multi-party project team. We're able to overcome these intricate interface issues, turning risks into opportunities. Hi, I'm Ben Yip, Chief Engineer of Drainage Services Department of Hong Kong SAR. I would like to express my thanks to our UDT team in making the project a great success under the framework of mutual trust and collaboration. You need to us the best. Firstly, I'd like to say thank you on behalf of Pick Everard and the whole team involved. It's a great honour to receive this award for the successful delivery of this outstanding project for Leicestershire County Council, bringing the Access Group's headquarters to the Loughborough Enterprise Park and delivering the largest new build office space in the county. It's been a fantastic journey from inception to completion, delivered on time and budget, supporting the council's ambitions to develop its estate, helping to provide long-term benefits for the region. The project was delivered on behalf of Perfect Circle via the SCAPE consultancy framework and adopted a true collaborative approach between stakeholders, client, contractor and the wider consultancy team, including multiple supply chain partners. The success has absolutely been down to the dedication and hard work of everyone involved, with special mention and thanks to Ollie Hatton as lead project manager for Pick Everard and Andrea Hopkins as the key client lead for Leicestershire County Council. Thank you again, and congratulations to all the other winners today. We are very to receive the award of in 2021. This is indeed the highest recognition of the endeavors made by the Development Bureau in making yeah, culture yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, first collaborative partner yeah, yeah. in the yeah. industry uh, for the use of NEC. Yeah, I would like to Oh, well, I was calling you because Matt sent me an email saying um, uh, 
is the course on Hi, site. sorry, I'm going to pause this. Please. Gerald Kelly, you're on the phone and we can yeah, hear you. Can yes, you mute your mic? That's fine. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll try and catch the other ones up. I'll hold it in. I'm sorry, I'm trying to, we're trying to fix it. We can't seem to mute him. I will just continue with the video. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, I'll, yeah, I'll do that. I'll, I'll get back to him. Okay. Jim, thanks. Thanks. Okay, I think I've done it. Okay, we're just going to return to the video now. Here at NEC Cayenne, we have completed a holistic study to evaluate the performance of NEC contracts based on our 10-year project information. The result, we assure us that we are on the right path. Looking ahead, we will continue our effort to broaden the applications of NEC in Hong Kong. The next milestone in our roadmap will be the launch of a new DEVB NEC suite of contract booklets. We believe that the mutual trust and cooperation implanted in our industry will enable us to build a better Hong Kong in the coming decade. We are delighted to receive the NEC Contractor of the Year Award for our Inter-Reservoir Transfer Scheme Tunnel Project here in Hong Kong. This project was the first NEC contract awarded to the Boy Construction Group in Hong Kong and it's an outstanding achievement for the entire team led by our project director Ivan Ng to receive this award. The success of any project of course is not just about the contractor. It's really determined by the working relationship between the contractor, client and project manager. On this project, our client, the Drainage Services Department of Hong Kong, the project manager Biniz and our Buig team openly embraced Clause 10.1 to work in a spirit of mutual trust and cooperation, genuinely making best for project decisions together in a timely manner and with all parties acting fairly and respectfully towards each other. I sincerely thank everyone at the Drainage Services Department of Hong Kong and Biniz for their leadership their support and collaboration to make this project a success. This award is for all of us. Thank you. It's a great honor for the Drainage Services Department and the Starter Corp project team to receive the NEC Awards 2021 Contract Innovation of the Year. With the support of the Drainage Services Department, we have been working collaboratively and actively implement different innovations since the commencement of the contracts. This encouraging result for the project team to take up the role of receiving the same award with better results from last year. These remarkable achievements showcase the collaboration spirit amongst the government, consultants and the contractor to implement this innovation with a common goal to benefit the engineering industry. Looking ahead, the DSD hopes to consolidate the collaborative culture of Hong Kong's construction industry through the adoption of the NEC with a view to fostering innovations and achieving better project performance in public works projects. Central Water's lead project manager for the Film Gas Grid Park, which is located behind me. This plant is able to operate biogas into renewable biomethane, which provides sustainable energy for up to 9,000 homes in the Coventry area. The plant will also help Seven Trent Water as an organisation to achieve sustainability goals, being a net zero carbon producer, and to provide all of its energy via renewable means. It was very important for Seven Trent Water to use a contract that would be used in a collaborative manner for dealing with such a technically challenging project. Trust and cooperation has been a foundation of interactions between Seven Trent Water and the contracted cost name for design, installed, and installed in the plant. 
The emphasis on cooperation was especially important when dealing with the unique and challenging events of Brexit and, COVID and the COVID pandemic. The AC's use of encouraging good communication and early warnings were critical in driving progress through the pandemic. So on the behalf of the whole film and gas grid team, may I say thanks to the NEC for recognising our efforts to support sustainability and climate resilience, and the recognition compliments work done by both Central Water and Castain in delivering projects that put sustainability and climate resilience at the forefront. Distinguished guests and speakers, friends online, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. It is my honor to speak in the NEC Users Group Online Conference this year in my dual capacity as the Permanent Secretary for Development Works, representing the government of the Hong Kong SAL, as well as the NEC Asia-Pacific Users Group Chair, representing the user community of NEC in Asia Pacific. Last time I spoke at the NEC conference in London was back to June 2019, exactly two years before. Because of the outbreak of the COVID-19, the conference has to go online. I do hope that fellow engineers and friends in the UK and other parts of the world are staying very well. With the current progress of vaccination all over the world, back to normalcy is not remote. Like other parts of the world, Hong Kong has also been hard hit by the pandemic. When compared with other industries like tourism, retail, etc., the construction industry has been lucky. And with the concerted efforts of the full spectrum of practitioners in keeping construction sites safe, construction activities could still move on although problems with some overseas supply chain were experienced in last year. Further to that, the Hong Kong construction industry also contributed in building the much needed and important facilities to equip Hong Kong in this battle against COVID-19. At the end of January last year, just a couple of days after celebrating the Year of the Vet, the Bureau was tasked to build temporary quarantine units within the shortest possible time. This was so sudden but important that we had never envisaged before. We accepted the challenge by applying Modular Integrated Construction, or MIC in short, for the task. MIC was relatively new to Hong Kong, and in fact, there wasn't any completed MIC project in Hong Kong at that time, although two MIC pilot projects were still ongoing during that period. Worse still, the supply chain outside Hong Kong were also badly affected by the pandemic. Facing all kinds of difficulties and challenges, with the collaborative efforts and the can-do spirit from all industry practitioners, including professionals, technicians, as well as frontline workers, we finally managed to complete some 4,000 quarantine units in various places of Hong Kong last year. Some of them were even completed in a month. This is surely a record that the entire Hong Kong construction industry is proud of. Apart from speed, these quarantine units were also built with quality. This is why the Bernal Award of the ICE highly commended the Lei Yu Moon MIC Quarantine Camp Project, the one at the top right-hand corner of this slide in 2020, to recognize the excellence in civil engineering. After we have succeeded in quarantine camp projects, there wasn't any briefing space for Development Bureau and my departments. In September last year, we were again tasked to undertake another nearly mission in possible project to build a temporary hospital right next to the Asian Well Expo of the airport island. Don't be misled by the name. Except the term temporary in the name, everything there was designed and built to permanent standards. 
Everything you see in the common hospital is inside this hospital except the operation theater. Again, with the close cooperation of the project team and the contractor, and through the round the clock, hard work of several thousands of workers on and off the site, the temporary hospital was completed in January 2021, just four months from the first day we occupied the site. It provides over 800 bags inside negative pressure wards and is instrumental to the battle against the latest wave of virus attack. In going through the success story of these two projects, some may point out that the use of MIC was an indispensable factor. No doubt I would say yes, but there is another dimension that I would like to add on top, the people in our industry. The delivery of the quarantine camps and the temporary hospital is founded on the shared goal to complete the projects within the shortest possible time for the good of Hong Kong people. While the project were not NEC once, but the spirit is truly NEC in that throughout the contract period, all the parties worked in unity and collaborated seamlessly to get over hurdles and seek ways to achieve the target. This people factor did not come by chance. I firmly believe that this is the fruit of the cultural change towards collaborative partnering in our industry after adoption of NEC for over 10 years. We have satisfactorily cultivated the spirit of mutual trust and cooperation across the entire industry to secure successful project outcomes. Talking about NEC, there are more I want to say here. Compared to the traditional general condition of contract, or what we call GCC, NEC form enables more equitable sharing of risk and better management of uncertainties. This is of particular importance to the contracting parties during the unprecedented challenges such as COVID-19. In addition to the partnering approach, NEC has built in many project management tools and optional clauses that can help contracting parties cope with uncertainties in a more flexible way. For instance, at the onset of COVID-19, as we foresaw that the spread of virus may cause significant hardship to the construction industry, we launch a comprehensive suite of supporting and relief measures to help our construction industry fight against COVID-19 and tie over the difficult period during the pandemic. Among all, we have introduced a special advance payment mechanism in construction contracts to ease contractors' cash flow difficulties by adopting secondary option clause X14 of NEC. Through this measure, we managed to allocate around 2,000 million Hong Kong dollars or around 200 million pounds sterling of advance payment to nearly 300 public works contracts in last year. Indeed, we have walked through a long journey before seeing the fruits right now. Since the launch of the first NEC project in 2009, we have accumulated experience from over 300 NEC works contracts and 70 NEC PSC consultancies. The total of NEC contracts amounts to over 160 billion Hong Kong dollars, or about 16 billion pounds sterling. The number of value of NEC contracts are growing significantly and healthily. In 2020, about half of the building and civil engineering contracts awarded by the government were in NEC contract form. We expect the share of NEC contracts will continue to rise in the years to come. As a visionary NEC client, the Development Bureau has been taking the lead to facilitate adoption of NEC in public works projects, including making adoption of NEC contract form in public works contracts a standing policy. Trying different options of NEC contracts and different types of contracts such as ECC, TSC, PSC, ECSC, and issuing practice looks and library of standard contract documents for NEC adoption. Apart from rolling out NEC projects covering different portfolio of public works, we have been piloting NEC for projects and different secondary options. 
including bonus for early completion, key performance indicators, and early contractors involvement. Having stepped into the first 10 years of NEC implementation in public works projects in 2019, we have initiated a study to reveal what kind of performance improvement we have achieved and what cultural change NEC has brought about in managing public works projects. This was the slide I presented at the NEC conference in June 2019, showing the results of some preliminary analysis at that time. With the support from our consultant, Dr. Isabel Chen of the University of Hong Kong, we have completed the holistic study based on the 10-year project information. Here, I would like to share with you some final key findings from this study. In a nutshell, we have collated the data set of 37 NEC ECC contracts and 280 GCC contracts of similar nature that were completed between 2009 and 2019. The graph on the left shows the distribution of the actual contract duration over original contract duration. The greater the value, the longer time a project is completed. If we compare the blue line of NEC to the orange line of GCC, we may note that NEC performs better in terms of time by about 10%. As to the cost performance as represented by the ratio of the final contract sum over original contract sum, you may note from the graph on the right that the blue and orange lines are very close to each other with about 2% difference. Based on this analysis, we can conclude that NEC and GPC have similar performance in respect of costs. With time-saving benefits seen in NEC through the last slide, one may further answer question, which NEC options performed better? The answer is here. We split the 37 sets of NEC contracts into two groups. One group comprising 25 sets of priced contracts under option A and B, and another 12 target contracts under option C and D. At the same time, we have also identified the same number of GCC contracts. They are comparable to these two sets of NEC contracts in terms of nature, size, and duration, and pair them up. You can see the two graphs on the right. The results are interesting. While both priced contracts under option A and B and target contracts under option C and D performed better than the equivalent sets of GCC contracts, a greater gain is seen in target contracts. It is 20% better here. The results tally with our proposition. Since NEC has proactive mechanism to monitor risk and initiate early mitigation actions, thus facilitate effective management of the project progress, in particular for target contracts, which, which are mostly adopted for projects of higher risk. Apart from taking quantitative analysis as presented above, we have also adopted a qualitative approach to gauge stakeholders' view on the performance of NEC. A questionnaire survey, focus group interviews, and a workshop have been conducted to collect feedback from NEC practitioners and different stakeholder groups. The survey results conclude that NEC outperforms the conventional GCC contract form particularly in terms of building mutual trust and cooperation between contracting parties, cultivating collaborative mindset of individuals, more effective risk and claims management, and better project portfolio management, including costs and time predictability. The above results reassured us that we are on the right path. Looking ahead, we'll continue our effort to broaden the applications of NEC in Hong Kong. We are in the process of establishing the NEC4 library to facilitate migration from NEC3 to NEC4. We will pilot the use of NEC4 DBO contract for district cooling systems in two development areas. We will also adopt early contractor involvement for suitable contracts.
Another key task in the pipeline would be the preparation of a new development bureau NEC switch of contract booklets. We are now working closely with the NEC UK on this project. It would be an important milestone in our roadmap, signifying the rooting of NEC in Hong Kong. I believe this NEC Hong Kong version could further drive NEC applications in Hong Kong and would be of help to other local and overseas players who are exploring adoption of NEC in their projects. Ladies and gentlemen, Hong Kong has come a long way before reaching our current stage of NEC adoption. I'm confident that the mutual trust and collaborative spirit implanted within our industry will enable us boldly moving forward to build a better Hong Kong. Stepping into a new era, particularly after experiencing the impact brought about by the pandemic, the construction industry worldwide may look for a new way of cooperation in contracting that could better deal with risk and manage unforeseen challenges. The pandemic, I believe, is a testimony of NEC, but there is always room for further enhancement to equip NEC as future solutions. With this in mind, I look forward to the continuous transformation of NEC that could be more adaptive to meet the unknown challenges of the future. Lastly, may I wish this conference a great success. I hope you all have enjoyable and fruitful discussion today. Thank you very much. Thank you. I really hope you've enjoyed, first of all, the videos about the awards. They're all very interesting. And again, congratulations to all the runners up and the winners. I was particularly impressed by the use of technology and also the great emphasis on sustainability. And I hope you've also all enjoyed Mr. Lamb's presentation. I was certainly impressed and I think there's a lot we can learn from it here in the UK. I'm looking forward to seeing that study which compared the use of NEC compared to the general conditions of contract. And I also very much support the move to NEC4. And um, we've had it for a few years and I think we should all be encouraged to move forward to NEC4, which has taken on board so much feedback and I do think it is an improved version. But I'm now going to pass over to Ian Hastings from the SK Observatory Intergovernment Organization to tell us about how NEC is helping to deliver the International SKA Telescope Project. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Um, just a quick introduction and a few words about my, myself and my role. Uh, my name is Ian Hastings. I am a fellow of the Chartered Institute of Procurement and Supply. Uh, I've been head of procurement services at the SKO now for nearly five years. Uh, it's a particularly interesting and exciting international collaborative project. Um, and um, I'll start the presentation with a short video uh, and then we'll move on through. It take this might is playing through YouTube, so it might be a slight delay. Okay, um, well, thank you very much. So uh, the next slide is a, 
it's a bit comical, but there's quite a lot of truth in it. Uh, this is probably our best ever hope of contacting extraterrestrial life to date. So I always throw this into presentations because it kind of gets people's attention. So we're studying cosmic dawn. We're building really what it amounts to a huge to a time machine, effectively. So we'll be able to look back uh, billions of light years back into when the the, the universe, uh, to probably to within three hundred thousand years after the Big Bang. So it's uh, the idea really is to be able to create almost a cartoon of uh, of uh, the birth of the universe that, that we that surrounds us, and in and and whilst doing that. We will hopefully make discoveries, that some of them we don't even know about. You know, the, the, the thing with building a big machine like this is you don't really know what it will be used for in 20 years time. And it is probably our best. And if we can pick up, a, uh, we could probably pick up a mobile phone signal from um, light years away. So if anybody's out there, we'll find them. So a quick overview of the observatory, then a quick overview of the project. So we're a, we're a United Nations treaty organization. Uh, we, the treaty came into effect on the 12th of January this year. We transitioned from a, a limited company to the, everybody moved from one organized to the, from the organization to the observatory on uh, 1st of May. Uh, we're a long-term international collaborative project. There are literally, for the, for the last probably five years, there's been, on any one day, there's been a thousand people working on this project globally. Uh, engineers, industrial partners, project managers, support staff, uh, collaboration. I heard we've heard a lot about collaboration in the in the in, with, in the previous speakers. Uh, a, a, a brilliant a presentation. Collaboration is part of our DNA. We couldn't do this sort of a project without a completely collaborative approach. So we're currently 16 countries collaborating. Uh, if you look at the countries that are collaborating, it, it, it amounts to about a third of the globe's population. Seven countries are currently full members of the SKO. Others are joining as we speak. Uh, we would hope to be 10 plus full members and there will be several countries with associate status. Uh, we're using an EC4 for all of our significant construction contracts. So um, it will, it, and, and really throughout this presentation, you'll hear perhaps not so much uh, mutual trust and collaboration, but you'll certainly hear the word collaboration and you'll certainly hear culture and values. Uh, uh, because uh, it, it's absolutely rooted in what we do. Next slide, please. So the project itself. Uh, so we will start a construction of what by many measures is the largest science facility ever constructed on Earth uh, on the 12th of on the 1st of July this year. That's literally in just over a week's time. With a first shovel in the deserts of Australia and South Africa early 2022. It's a two billion euro project. Uh, there will be 70 plus tier one NEC4 contracts. We're building nearly 200 uh, big mid frequency dishes in South Africa and an array of 132 smaller low frequency antennas in Australia. It's an incredibly technically challenging project. Significant data handling and processing. Uh, in fact, the SKO to the telescopes are often called software telescopes. The amount of data collected any, in any one day is bigger than the world's global internet traffic in any one year. Uh, we're globally headquartered in the, in the UK. We have a global supply chain and we are also building uh, regional science centres, big uh, you know, high powered, high performance computer centres uh, in three places around the globe. That's outside of the current scope, but it, we, the, the cubes of data that the two telescopes uh, uh, we will we will process them a bit and then but then they need to go on to bigger computers to make sense of it all. So next slide, please. So this is just a just to get a kind of an idea of really, you know, we're we're one observatory, two telescopes spread across three continents. Uh, like I said, the, you've got uh, the low telescope in um, Western Australia. Just to give you an idea of scale, uh, we have a piece of land, so we are effectively um, we're tenants on a piece of land in Southwest Australia that's the size of the Netherlands. And in terms of remoteness, there's 80 inhabitants in, in, on, on our piece of land. Uh, it's qu not quite so remote in South Africa, but we're in the Karoo Desert. Um, and, um, you know, so it's, uh, but it's, you know, again, it's very, very remote. You need to be in remote locations these days to be able to do uh, radio astronomy. Mobile phones and aircraft and aeroplanes cause 
problems for us. And our global headquarters is in the UK. So this is a project, in fact, that goes back. It's like it starts here from 2012. In fact, the project really goes right back to probably nine, to the 1980s. This was first dreamed of. Uh, a guy called uh, uh, Mr. Rawlings um, uh, uh, at University of Manchester kind of started the ball rolling. And it really started, the ball started to gather a bit of momentum in about 2012. And the ball is going extremely fast now uh, because, uh, you know, after transitioning from the organisation to the SKO, uh, we, in fact, this is kind of a seminal moment in my career as well, because on Friday we present to our council uh, our construction proposal. And we would, um, you know, I think we're, we're quietly confident that we'll get permission to start construction uh, this Friday on the 25th of July. Next slide, please. OK, so these, these are just the two, these are two uh, incredibly thick documents that we've put together, basically explaining how we'll construct and operate the observatory. So I, I didn't want to bore people with a kind of a technical presentation or a presentation about NEC4. I'm not an NEC4. I'm not an NEC expert at all. I would consider myself to be a procurement expert, but I'm definitely not a contracts expert. If anybody's got questions related to NEC4, there are far be better qualified people on this in this conference than me to answer those. What I want to concentrate on today is really our core mission, uh, values, vision and strategies and how well aligned they are with, their, with the core uh, values of NEC. So you know, why we exist, what do we believe in, what, what do we want to be and how will we, will we become what we want to be? So our mission is pretty, simple, pretty straightforward really, is to build and operate cutting edge radio telescopes to transform our understanding of the universe and deliver benefits to society through global collaboration and innovation. Um, you know, when you speak to people in, in our HQ, uh, obviously you've got a lot of scientists, you've got a lot of astrophysicists, you've got a lot of engineers, you've got a lot of project managers, but when you really drill down deeply, the project's all about global collaboration. And then we move on to values. So I'm not going to read this. There's a bit of a busy slide, but so we, what are we about? What are our core values? So we're we've spent and we've invested an enormous amount of time, effort, and money in in basically drilling down to what we really believe in as a as a as an organisation, as an observatory. So we believe we're we believe in diversity and inclusion. We're an incredibly diverse outfit. We believe in creativity and innovation, excellence, collaboration, and sustainability. Not just sustainability in terms of you know, uh, the environment, but sustainability in terms of, you know, we, we're we working in two particularly sensitive sites and we're well aware of a need to have a social license to operate on both. We intend to sort of, you know, that, so that's so that's really, really key to what we're trying to achieve here. Next slide, please. And then our vision. So it's, we are one observatory with two telescopes on three continents, a 21st century observatory, and an intergovernmental organisation with sustainability and respect to all our communities at its heart, driven by a commitment to fundamental science and technology. Like I say, we're building a time machine in Australia and South Africa. And then in terms of strategies, uh, you know, we, we, we're strong believers in risk-based planning. We are, you know, we, we are, there's a, probably more people with PhDs in one organisation than any other that I've ever worked. And I've worked in quite a few tech heavy environments before. We take a very, some would call it a Cartesian, but others would say we are a very deterministic and empirical approach to risk and contingency managing. We are, we are, we've de-risked the project to some extent by adopting a stage delivery. So we, we're building an array and we can build out. What we're building, what we hope to start construction of um, on Monday, because that's when it is, is SK1. There is an intent to build this out to SK2, which will cover the entire continent of Africa. Uh, we, we, we believe in simple and effective tools and processes that encourage and develop collaboration and trust, which is why we're using NEC4, why, which is why we're using tools like CMAR. We are, are great believers in lean, agile techniques and processes. We're trying to do things differently. There are there is a, there are already IGOs that do uh, big science, uh, mega science infrastructure projects. We, we 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 listen to what the way they're doing things, and we try to we we try to become more lean and more agile. Um, and we always do the th the easiest thing with the highest economic benefit first. 
And the other thing that you'll hear quite often around uh, the SKO is we, we like to fail fast. What we're doing is innovative. And there are, there's never a there's, with an innovative, innovative project, there's never a guarantee of success. What we want to do, though, is we want to fail fast and move on and try again. Uh, we want to measure what's important to us. We want, and, very, and very importantly, again, we want to give everybody a fair go. We need a social license to operate at both our host country sites. And we want to work with like minded organisations. Again, these are the, just the two key documents, really. Um, so in terms of procurement and contracting, it's not an easy environment in which we operate. We, we, we have to apply something called fair work return. Member countries get guaranteed industrial return that is matched to their financial investment and strategic technical priorities. The UK is a significant um, stakeholder in this project. They're interested in this because it, it's, it's really a software telescope. It, it, it speaks to uh, 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 it speaks to big data and artificial intelligence key parts of the UK's industrial strategy going forward. Uh, all, all the significant SKA construction work packages have been allocated at the member country level. There's no competition between international uh, partners. There, there was a good reason for that. We didn't want any fratricide or falling out between members of this organisation. However, there are plenty of opportunities to create competitive tension between suppliers and contractors within local markets. So we've got a hybrid kind of strategy. It's allocative. If you look, at the, if you the first layer looks very uncompetitive. You peel that away, and it's extremely competitive. There are three main categories of spend: infrastructure, all things to do with antennas, and then all things to do with computers. There are fifty plus tier one contracts, probably near a seventy actually. We've been trying to keep this low, but it keeps bubbling up. We we run a three stage procurement process: market survey, pre qualification, and tender. We have a strong focus on value. We are not going for, we will never go for the lowest price technically compliant solution. We will, we, we focus on quality, cost of ownership and sustainability. Or, but we're back to our core values again. Uh, our early contract drafts are ready to support uh, a July invitation to tender for many of the big packages. The first market surveys were released in Australia on the 24th of May. So we're taking the project, we're going as far, we're getting ahead of ourselves as far as we can without actually making any commitments. And you can see there on the right hand side, uh, there's a chat there that looks remarkably like you grant to me, but in fact, it's uh, it's Christian Porter, uh, who's the Minister of uh, Industry, Science and Technology in Australia. Uh, big, big supporter of the project. Uh, and then we've got 18 months of intense procurement activity starting from the 1st of July, going uh, uh, by which time we would ho hopefully have most of our, our tier one contracts let. And then, Really, why an EC4? Um, I remember, in fact, Rob Gerard was one of the guys that actually uh, helped us initially to decide. Yeah, you know, we thought FIDIC, we thought NEC4, we thought develop our own terms and conditions, we thought kind of poach them from um, the European Southern Observatory. But in the end, we, we kind of went round the boy a few times and we decided that the NEC4, I think you can tell from this presentation, it aligns incredibly well with our own SKO cultures and values. It's collaborative, it's fair, it's non-adversarial, and it's process driven. It lends itself remarkably well to an international mega science project. The NEC, the NEC4 suite provides grounded, flexible contracting solutions. In fact, since launching NEC4 at SKO, we've been contacted by CERN because they, they, they are thinking about building a 100 kilometer new tunnel under France and Switzerland, and they're thinking about using NEC4 for their for all their tunneling. It's a pro, it, it's a pro, we like the process driven approach. You know, we're Cartesian sort of people, a lot of scientists, a lot of engineers. It gives us tools and processes that enable us to empower our contractors and staff. It's plain, simple, and modern. You know, we kind of we embrace modernity. Um, you know, we've got we've got core we've got core clauses. We're trying to keep it. We're, we're trying to avoid Z clauses as much as possible, but we do have a curated library of approved Z clauses which people can dip into. The templates are more agnostic than in-house standard contracts used by our peers. Basic commercial fairness is at the core of our values. You know, we don't want to, we're not trying to ratchet or leverage or kind of arbitrage at the deals here. We we want we want fairness. It's already being used in Australia and South Africa, uh, and we're obviously building something as weird and wacky as a as a radio as, a, as two big radio telescopes in the middle of nowhere. 
you need a, an eclectic mix of, you know, it, you, we're buying an eclectic mix of goods, works and services, and we need a very rich palette. The NEC4 suite of contracts meets most of our day-to-day -day contracting needs. I think we'll probably get away with an NEC4 contract or a purchase order, basically. So we're using the PSC, the, the short form, we're using the frameworks, we're using the supply contracts and the supply short, we're using the ECC, we're using the ECSC, and we're using the, uh, the DBO contract for our site camp in Australia. So the whole lot, basically. And then we're using the NEC4 suite extremely flexibly. I think one of the things that we're particularly proud of uh, I, I mentioned it earlier in the in, in the presentation. Is this is a software con? This is a software. These are two 21st century software telescopes, effectively, with with, with a steer with, and the low telescope even has a steerable beam. So we are uh, we're all aware of you know this developing software, complex software with incredibly complex algorithms is a perennial problem for many large organisations. And I think you know those of a certain age will recall the absolute cat catastrophe of the NHS spending on software projects. It's been a litany of failure. We're trying to do things a bit differently. So we're using the NEC4. We sort of alighted on the NEC4 contract suite as being kind of, it's normally used for construction, but we think it's a brilliant fit with developing software actually. So we're using NEC4 contracts to provide a control process driven contractual environment that, and it lends itself extremely well to a lean agile environment and that's what we're, we're using safe uh, a scaled agile framework to deliver to, to, uh, to build our um, software you know um, the classic sprints um, um, applications uh, features and epics and, uh, and it's got so far so good we're we're on our uh, we're on our um, 12th project increment in terms of the software development we've started rolling out NEC4 now and we think it's going to be a great success, perhaps a template for the future. So I'll just give you a quick example of that, really. So software development, we have 40 international suppliers. We have 150 software developers. These are all but these are all over the world. I can't emphasize that enough. India, Switzerland, France, UK, uh, China. Um, and we're, what we're doing is we're using basically we're using the framework contracts and then we're issuing per PSSCs under the frameworks to basically um, and the, uh, with, with a kind of a cadence that matches our program increments. So what's unique about our approach? Well, we're we're using this scaled agile framework. The key per we've got about 150 key persons. They're appointed under the software development frameworks and, and we embrace and, and then we've also worked with a uh, We've worked with a lady called Kate Vitasek at the University of, um, 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 I think it's Michigan or Tennessee. I think it's Tennessee, actually. She's a part of a Nobel Prize winning team that uh, did all that work on um, contracts, um, theory of contracts and relational contracting. So what we've done is we've embedded a lot of this stuff on relational contracting. We had a series of workshops with her and, and, and a gentleman and a professor from Harvard. And we've in, and we've we've actually embedded a lot of this relate relational contracting stuff within the frameworks. So, so we had these relational contracting workshops. We invited key organisations to participate in basically a sh creating a shared vision for the software and computing ecosystem. And we've all bought into this now. So the client, us, and all the suppliers. Have the following shared vision and i think you can you know i, I won't dwell too much on this but you know, those are the, the these are the sort of the, the we're all brought into this strategic uh, uh, uh this the strategic vision of how we intend to run our software development program and then you can see here there is a you know because it's not easy this there's a large number of contracts it scaling software development is incredibly difficult uh, we've we the, the adoption of relational contracting requires a very high degree of transparency, information sharing, and consensus in the achieving and enforcing of decisions. Uh, we, and one decision by one party affects everybody else. Uh, so we're so the solution to our this problem was really this kind of this framework governance, which keeps everybody aligned and ensures the relationship evolves to meet the challenging requirements. And, and and be able to deliver on the on the strategic vision and, and objectives. Um, and like I say, so far so good. And uh, I think that's probably the end of my um, my presentation actually. So thank you very much. And um, 
I would just like to say, as I would say at the end of all my presentations, we thank and acknowledge the Indigenous peoples of Australia and South Africa for allowing us to build this amazing machine on their land. Thank you, and this was really incredible and um, what, what, what a fascinating project. And it's also great to see how NEC is being used. And I was particularly interested in the use of NEC for software projects and especially all the work you've done on relational contracting. So hopefully we'll get to hear more about it um, in more detail in another occasion. It is really sort of a small step of ta in taking NEC into space projects and we'll see what the future holds for us. But for the final session, I'm now going to hand over to Peter Higgins, the NEC4 board chair, and also to Julia and Rob Horn from the DRBF to talk about dispute resolution and the use of DABs in NEC and on international construction projects. Right, we've lost Julie. <laughs> Hi, sorry, my camera wasn't coming on. Hi, my name is Julie Forsyth. Uh, thank you, Shai. Um, I'm just butting in in front of Rob and Peter, um, who are going to talk to you about dispute boards and the NEC, just to tell you a little bit, for those of you who don't know, about the uh, the Dispute Resolution Board Foundation, the DRBF, as we like, it's much easier to call it. Um, I'm the, excuse me, <clears throat> the UK representative um, of the DRBF. Um, and we're very, very happy. Thank you very much for inviting us to talk at your conference today. Um, and so uh, we're, we're going to tell you a little bit about what we do in the in, about dispute boards and our promotion of them in the DRBF. It's a non-profit organisation, um, and we just we we promote the boards within all types of projects. Clearly, engineering is the key one today. Um, construction is the main, I'm a construction solicitor, so that's the only bit I know about, but it was interesting to hear Ian talking about software because that is a very large, a very big area for dispute boards, as I understand it, and we are promoting broader use of them outside the construction area and uh, for members that are interested in that. Um, we've got worldwide membership and uh, we have events all over the world on, on topics yeah. all over the world. I know that NEC is very international and you've got quite a few international speakers and uh, and people attending today from all over the place. So we do have Australia, America, um, we've got three regions, lots of different input on different laws and different in types of uh, projects. Um, we uh, also do training, so helping people to learn about dispute boards and the key thing I think really is that dispute boards have been around a long time um, more recently with the NEC which is great but they've traditionally been about dispute resolution when there's a conflict and as you're going to hear today I think they we're promoting much more in the modern times the dispute avoidance role of a board which is the lesser known role at the, of dispute boards um, so we've had we have discussions in the UK we've got 78 members we have Quite, uh, which is quite a, we're one of the larger groups and we have a lot of events. We welcome any input, anybody here who's not already a member would like to join, we would be, you'd be very welcome to join and help us to promote those boards, talk about what you do. Uh, we have members meetings to introduce each other and to give us ideas of what, uh, ways that we can promote. So please that you will be receiving um, with, your, with your slide pack at the end, details of the DRB. DRBF, the DRB website, um, so that you can join. And um, we would love to see you all at any event that you'd like to join, like to come along to. So uh, without any more ado, I will pass you over to Rob, who will tell you what you're waiting to hear. Thanks very much. Well, actually, just pause for a moment, because I'm going to spend a couple of minutes before uh, Rob takes over. Um, the main oh, part is really to explain about how W3, the Dispute um, Avoidance Board, works. But what I want to do is just spend a few minutes, just a couple of minutes, just explaining about how the NEC approach is aimed at avoiding disputes from the start, not just through the dispute board, but through the whole process. And this is through what we think is working together. Um, the knowledge of what comes next helps to remove surprises and re removes the likelihood of disputes. If you know what's coming out on next, you can be prepared for it and you're less likely to fall out over being confused and surprised. So that, that's part of the process. 
Um, we've got quite a number of tools which we use to stimulate this approach. And I'll just quickly run through a few of those in the next slide. Obviously, mutual trust and cooperation. A lot of talk about what that means. Very simple in my mind. Um, we trust people to do what the contract says you've got to do. And we work together in helping to do what's necessary to get a successful project. Very simple. Um, but, it's, but it's a key point behind the whole of the contract approach is helping people working together and trying to get things done sensibly. Early warning. Fundamental. It, it, it surprised me that old contract didn't have this and it caused a lot of problems because of it. People were hiding stuff until it was most important, most, most helpful for them financially. Early warning is all about making sure that people know what's going to go wrong before it goes wrong and sorting it so it doesn't go wrong. That way you avoid disputes. Accepted programme. This is my point about knowing what's happening. You've got a detailed programme which is kept completely up to date, regularly replaced and updated with what's happened so far and what's to be done in the future, which may be different from what you thought was going to be done last month. So the programme is useful to let people know what's coming next and what they need to prepare for. The compensation event process. Again, no surprise, we, we, we look at how, how you sort out things, you agree the time and money effective issues before they've actually happened as far as possible. And that way you're both motivated to getting the job done efficiently and not worrying later about how we're going to recover cost for this because you know in advance what that is. Target share. Both parties motivated to avoid overspend because they're both going to suffer if they do overspend. So working together. Multi-party collaboration. Lots of different contractors working on one site, one area, work together, helping each other, letting each other know when things are going wrong and sorting out problems that each other have. Early contractor involvement. Getting the contractor involved right at the very start before you commit yourselves to what you're going to build. All of these things together, help the parties work together. And in the next slide, we, we, we think this is, this is a key point, is that if you work together, you will avoid disputes. Now, the Dispute Avoidance Board was developed to carry on with that principle, not Dispute Resolution Board, but a Dispute Avoidance Board. I'll pass over now to Rob. Thanks very much, Peter. So what, what I'm going to try and talk through is how W3 of the NEC4 form of contract works to enable dispute boards to be effectively deployed on projects. But I thought I'd start with a little bit of background. So how does the dispute board fit into this sort of slightly broader context of an NEC4 project, whether it's got problems or, or, or not? So I think the starting point when you're thinking about disputes generally within your contract is to remember the options that are available. So we have W1, W2, W3 as the dispute um, avoidance resolution um, forums. Uh, W1, W2 both focused on adjudication, whether um, in the UK or in an international contract, so whether the um, Housing Grants Construction Regeneration Act applies or not. I think a really important point that's often missed in W1 and W2, however, is the um, starting point under both of those um, options, which is an escalation process. So you don't start off with um, straight into adjudication. The idea is that you have senior representatives getting together to talk about things first. And then you look at W3, and that whilst that doesn't have the escalation process. Firstly, I suppose it could do. There's no reason why you couldn't have it. But that escalation process has really been subsumed into a dispute avoidance board. So rather than having senior executives from the parties talking about the project and how to resolve problems, what you've done from the outset is brought in a group of uh, highly qualified, specialised individuals to help the project team all work together to deliver the project they want to deliver or intended to deliver at the outset of the project. Uh, Peter's run through some of those um, key points or key clauses under the NEC, which are really important to uh, deal with that what comes next question and to bring a little bit of forethought foresight into the project. But a couple of others that, that I'd pick up, um, the risk reduction meetings, which follow on from the early warning notices, really important means of having that discussion um, and engaging the parties in 
the, the very beginning, the very uh, a genesis of potential disputes in the future. And potential disputes is a phrase I'll, I'll come back to um, when we start looking at the tribunal specifically. Compensation event discussion. So we all talk about compensation event notices, but often too easily forget that once the notice has gone in, the anticipation is that everyone's going to sit and talk about it and think about how the potential event is going to impact the project. How do we manage that? How do we deal with the repercussions of it to best manage the new piece of information, the compensation event into the existing project? And then the, the last point, um, the, the tribunal. Don't forget that there is a tribunal for resolving disputes. And I think from my perspective, and I'm a, I'm a disputes lawyer, so perhaps I, I would say this, wouldn't I? But I don't think you should, you should, no one should be scared of going to the tribunal. The tribunal's there for a purpose. You shouldn't go to it too quickly or too readily, but you shouldn't feel embarrassed that you need to go to a tribunal. Differences of opinion happen. Sometimes you can't unlock them yourselves. Sometimes it's really useful to engage in a tribunal process, and it can be a really positive tool. Um, I think that that's the real key is that it's a tool in your toolbox, as all of the rest of these are, and you've got to use it at the appropriate time, not too early, not too late. When you're thinking about disputes generally, but particularly dispute boards, I've just listed on the right hand side of this slide a few questions, which I think are the, the key ones um, to, to, to have in mind as, as you're sort of going through the process. And you've got to start with what what do you mean? Uh, what's a dispute? When, when do you know you've got one? And that's something I'll return to in a moment, because that's something that's really focused on in um, W3 and dis dispute boards. Um, how quickly do you need it resolved? Do you, do you have a project which is going to be very fast paced? So fast decisions are really important. What are the issues that are likely to come up on this project? Do you need a broad set of skills or do you need a very narrow set of skills because only one type of issue is ever going to come up? And really think about the balance in your project and remembering all the tools that are in your toolbox. The balance between avoidance and resolution. How important is it that you can get to quick enforceable decisions as opposed to processes that enable the parties to find the solutions themselves and perhaps come up with slightly more creative approaches. So moving on from that, that overview, I'm going to look at three three different stages of the process of using a board. So I'm going to start here with establishing the board. The right hand, left hand side here goes through what's in the contract and the right hand side is really my comment, my few thoughts on what, what that means and what you should be thinking about. So the, the first point is um, if you're going to have a dispute board, how many people is a board made up of? It could be one or it could be three. In theory, it could be more, but um, I think it's unusual to have see a need for more than, than three people in, in most projects. But what drives you between the, the one or three, in my view, is how much uh, breadth of skills do you need within to be captured within that board, balanced again against the cost and um, difficulty of engaging a, a larger number of, of board members. So really important to engage at the very outset when you're first entering into the contract, how many board members do you need? And the answer to that is almost invariably driven by well, what purpose is it they're solving? What do we want them to get into? What do we want them to understand? Do we want three engineers? Do we want an engineer, a lawyer, an accountant? What, what is it that we think might cause us some sticking points that we won't be able to resolve ourselves? That's really what the board's getting at. The next important point um, is contained in W3.12, and that is that the board is intended to be appointed at the start date. And I'll come back to um, how often they, they um, are engaged in the project, but really important that the, the board is there from the outset. So you can really start, they can get the view of the project as it is built out, not trying to come in at the end like a normal tribunal or adjudicator would do and historically try and unpick a project to see what was happening. If you're there from the beginning and you're highly experienced and you aren't tied into any particular party's view, that what happens next question is much easier to identify. Once you've identified the question, you start being able to find answers and solutions that are going to work for the project. So really important that the board is established and functional right from the outset. The next point, um, which is, again, absolutely key 
is that the appointment of the board or the establishment of the board um, is by agreement between the parties. So each party might pick a, a board member themselves and then the parties agree on the third person who makes up that board. And again, importantly, in the dispute board mechanism and the NEC, th there is no hierarchy amongst board members. You don't have a chair that has a casting vote or anything like that in, in this process. So what you're really looking for is consensus amongst the board, a, a diversity of ideas, a diversity of opportunity being generated, um, which you get much more easily if you don't have a hierarchical system. And the last point, just to, I suppose a note of caution, but just to, to bear in mind, there's no contractual mechanism for removing the board once it's in place. Now, I think that's that could, could be a good thing. Um, no, no one can uh, sort of try and back out of their contractual obligations too easily. Um, but, but also, uh, of course, the parties could agree um, extra contractually, if you like, to remove the board and do something else if they found the board wasn't wasn't working. Would they ever do that? Well, I think if the board's doing its job and has the credibility um, and trust of the parties and is functioning properly, no, they never would. Um, because one, I, from my personal experience, once a board is in place, if they're doing their job properly, um, they gain a huge amount of trust and the parties start to rely on them quite a lot, po possibly too much sometimes, um, rather, than, rather than not enough. But moving on, once you've got the board in place, what do they do? Um, starting point is the intention is very clearly that the board visits the site at regular intervals. Now, NEC leaves it completely open to the parties um, how often or how regular those site visits are and requires um, within the contract data for you to fill in how uh, what, what should the, be the maximum duration between site visits. Now, it doesn't mean that is exactly when they are always going to visit site, but gives you an idea of uh, how much time can elapse on the project between visits and involvement of the uh, dispute board. And as I said earlier, in terms of getting the board engaged right at the outset, really important that the board is able to pick, build up a picture of how the project's developed rather than trying to relearn things from, from the documents. We, we all know um, documents are never perfect. It's one of the biggest challenges in avoiding and resolving any disputes. So um, think very hard about how often you want the board in place. So there's always a temptation to say, well, I don't want them to come to site too often because they're jolly expensive and I, I don't get much value for them because I'm not going to have any problems on my project. Um, if that's your thinking, then you probably don't want to have a dispute board at all, and you need to rethink your uh, process and um, uh, expectation for how you're going to deal with those sticking points. But for me, you need to think um, not necessarily uh, monthly, but, but probably you need to look at the entire duration of the project, look at key dates within the project, how often do they come up, how often do you want them on site? So you, you would certainly want the board to attend site before any major piece of the construction is completed. So for example, if you're building a road, when you get to uh, the, the, the sub-base layer, you probably want the uh, dispute board to come on site and have a look at how's it all progressing, are we on track, is everything okay? When they do come on site, of course, you're going to have to have something to talk about. And the idea here under W316 is that the parties propose an agenda, but the board decides what it is they want to talk about and how they want to engage with the parties. Again, um, without being over restrictive, I think that's a good match between the parties wanting to flush out what it is they want to talk about, but the board using their experience and expertise look at what's really important, what's likely to go from a possible problem to a potential dispute to something that we can help resolve. And I think that's um, a really important point. It stops either party driving the agenda as well, um, that it's all ceded to the board to deal with. And then finally, on this slide, in, in terms of during the project, what's the board doing? Um, the expectation is they're going to review all the progress reports and any other information that's being generated on site um, that is useful and helpful to them in considering um, the, the, their role on the pro on the project. So the, the idea is they don't only interact with the project once they're on site for those site visits, but they're keeping 
a, a view and overwatch over the project as it progresses and have the opportunity, therefore, to start raising questions, queries to the parties much more efficiently, either during a site visit or potentially between site visits if necessary. And then moving on to the, to, to the next slide, just thinking about, OK, so we've got a board understand what they do on a project. Now we'll look at, well, what do they do in terms of dispute avoidance, dispute resolution? Cheryl can move on to the next slide. Thank you. Um, so when we're looking at dealing with disputes, the first point is the board's focus is on this, this concept of a potential dispute. So the, the, the Putting aside for a moment, what, what does that really mean? What, what is a potential dispute? How do you know what a potential dispute is? The theory, the intention is very clear that the board is interacting and intervening before a dispute actually materializes. So before the parties become entrenched, before they really formulate hard um, positions um, in the project, the board is there to try and uh, find alternatives, find a way through the, 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 the potential problem. Um, inevitably, that means early engagement, which means the board has to know what's going on on the site. They have to be attending site. They have to be interacting with the parties. Otherwise, that part of the process doesn't work. And the whole idea, as Peter mentioned, the, the what comes next starts to fall apart. Once you think you have a potential dispute, um, the idea is that it's referred to the board um, for them to consider, have a look at. Um, within two to four weeks after the notification of, of this potential dispute. There's no particular form that the notice needs to take, um, but the idea is to get something um, that's clear and um, uh, sort of explanatory to the board so that they can engage with the problem and try and find a solution that works for, for everyone or is the correct legal solution to, the, to, to a problem. Which means the board can take the initiative, W3.26. It's not just about the parties defining quite carefully, and I was going to say cleverly as well, through their through their legal teams, what they want a board to discuss and, and consider, as some people can do with adjudication by setting the agenda. The board takes the initiative. They have a broad remit. They will and should get under the skin of the problem to really try and find out what's going on, how's it impacting the project, how do we find a solution? If you can't find a solution, then the next step is the board makes a recommendation. Um, the re recommendation itself, there's no form or format to. It could be oral. I would expect it to be written. The problem is, or the problem as perceived by some people is this recommendation isn't a decision. Okay, so it's not on the face of the contract clearly binding and requires the parties to comply with it. I think that has pros and cons to it either way around. Um, sometimes you definitely don't want a binding decision. Actually, you'd much rather have something that is more persuasive in a recommendation. However, contract goes on to say, once the board has made a recommendation, you can go to a tribunal, but only if you give a, 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 an NOD, a notice of dissatisfaction within the required period. So if you don't give that notice within the required period, then the dispute that was referred and the recommendation that was made cannot be taken to tribunal. So whilst it's a recommendation, you can see how actually a recommendation starts to look binding if it's not challenged. So it's, it, it starts to look a little bit similar to an adjudication process. Again, adjudication in the UK, temporarily final and binding um, under the NEC, you have a specified period in which to challenge it. Otherwise, it is finally final and binding. Um, uh, so the same sort of idea with the, the, the dispute board, doesn't lock anyone out of challenging the process, but enables the parties to move on um, if the um, uh, someone doesn't like the recommendation or simply doesn't act, act or, or react to the process. Just overarching all of that, um, I think dispute boards aren't used that often in the UK. We're far too used to using um, adjudication now. Um, I suspect that will change to some extent. Um, I think dispute boards are an interesting and different mechanism for the right parties with the right projects. They work can work extremely well. Um, I note that within the NECW3, the intention is that you don't use dispute boards where uh, UK Construction Act applies. 
my view is you could quite easily use them as long as it's with a bit of forethought as to why you want those two processes to run in parallel. The way the dispute board works in the NEC um, for those looking at international projects is, is quite different um, to how the BIDIC model works, where it's much more uh, focused and born out of the resolution board type approach rather than the dispute avoidance board approach. Slightly changed now, FIDIC have sort of come back round to the idea of it being more about avoidance than, um, than just finding solutions. But um, it's interesting, again, that NEC sort of started at the, the, the other end of that, that distinction, um, looking at um, avoidance rather than resolution. Um, that, that's been a really quick run through of how W3 works. Um, I can see there's been a couple of questions in, in the chat. Um, th there is a discussion session, I know, again, this, this afternoon. Um, but I'll hand now back to, to, to Shai as the chair to finish off this session. Thanks, Rob, um, and thanks, Peter. This has been really helpful, um, and it is interesting to see how this will all develop. I, I was wondering, before we deal with any questions, is NEC has published a practice note about using dispute boards in the UK together with adjudication, and I was wondering how both of you see it working in parallel and the benefits of that approach, potentially. Start with you, Rob. Um, so, so I, I think you, you, you can guess from what, what I just said a moment ago, I think they can work very well in, in principle, they can work very well together. Um, you, you need to think about how the process is going to work. The, 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 running the, the two in parallel, obviously you can't curtail the appointment or the use of adjudication until after a dispute board has, has given a view. Um, but hopefully if your dispute board is doing its job properly, you'll have even less to go to adjudication. It's nice to have, I think, an option to just get a, a determination sometimes and get that sort of final clarity and certainty, particularly where it's, a, as you often see, um, a particular uh, dispute around the interpretation of a clause of the contract. Um, if you can dispose of those through adjudication, um, it, it can work really, really well and leave the dispute board to look at the more technical, more involved problems and issues that you see in the in the project and allow them to focus on finding slightly more innovative solutions rather than just, you know, does the contract say X or does it say Y? I think one thing I, I think about is that um, if you're using adjudication a dispute board in the UK, then obviously the housing grant tax impacts on how it's going to work. You're really using the, the dispute board as replacement, very clear replacement for the senior reps. Um, you're, you're getting something from the dispute board, which actually is, um, as far as the parties, if the parties want to go to adjudication, you could, you could, it just, it is meaningless. They don't, they could just ignore it. And the, 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 the bar we've got on referral to the tribunal, I think, probably doesn't work, Rob, unless you can advise otherwise, that if you've got a recommendation and you don't issue a notice of dispute, um, presumably you can still notice, uh, give a notice of adjudication under the under the Act and ignore the fact that you can't refer it to the, to the uh, tribunal. A, a really interesting question, probably one we might pick up this afternoon in the yeah. in the discussion group. I think immediately the, the, the question or, or the, the thing you'd have to focus on is if you've had a decision or recommendation from the board that there hasn't been a notice served against, can you still have a dispute? And that, because if you haven't got a dispute, you can't go to adjudication. So if you can't give the notification, you can't have a dispute, therefore you can't have an adjudication. So that's that's probably the, the context you'd start looking at it in. Yeah. It's a legal, legal issue rather than a practical one that it comes Absolutely. down. I'll let the lawyers decide that one. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it, it probably reinforces the idea that you should avoid trying to get into disputes. And, and, and I guess another question from a practical level, um, what, where do you find those people? I mean, Rob, you've mentioned a trial of, I think it was a lawyer, engineer and accountant. Uh, what do you guys see as working in practice and where do you find those people with the right skills? Um, so certainly from a, from a DRBF perspective um, when you look sort of internationally ar around the globe 
the temptation always is to load your tribunal, your, your sorry, your um, board with engineers on the basis that um, a lot of people are very used to FIDIC and engineers are uh, the sort of all, all seeing being under a, a FIDIC that just know everything about everything. Um, my view is the best um, tribunals or best best um, uh, dispute boards work where you've got a range of skills that interlock and overlap where the individuals understand what they're expert in and what they are not expert in and are prepared between the board themselves to take the lead on different issues um, and allow the others to bring their expertise to the party. If, if you have a board that's all made up of a single um, set of professional backgrounds, you're quite limited if you have a problem that steps outside that. The, the question um, always is how, how do you go about finding the right individuals? But I think that that's true of any board process or any adjudication process. If you get the right individuals, it works. If you don't get the right individuals, you're going to struggle. I think I think the the, the intention perhaps is that your parties can nominate somebody, but um, the preference will always be that for a major project that the parties sit um, talk talk to each other before they appoint the members and agree who is the right people to be on that panel, uh, assuming that we're going to have three for in, in that case. Okay. Uh, I was wondering if you have access to the chat box, if there were any other questions you've wanted to answer from anybody who's been listening in. And if not, it sounds like you've got to your other session in the afternoon where you'll be looking at some of those issues in a bit more detail. There's a quick one here. Can the parties extend the period to issue the notice of dispute? Um, I think they can because under the contract, if, if the parties agree, if the project manager and the contractor agree, any time period could be extended as long as the time period has not expired. So I guess they can agree. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree with that, Peter. And uh, another interesting question, what happens if some someone on your board becomes incapacitated for, for, for whatever reason. Um, th there is a process for appointing another. Either you could do you could appoint someone else by agreement or in default of agreement, um, the uh, contract data should include a nominating body for your um, dispute board um, process. OK, another question there. Who pays for the board members? <laughs> Well, who pays for everything? Client, client does, doesn't it? <laughs> At the end of the day. Yeah, yeah. The, I mean, it's, it, it's interesting, isn't it? It's always, it's always very easy to say, well, OK, well, the, the contractor pays for the one that he's appointed, which he, which he might do. The employer pays for the one that the, or the client pays for the one that he's appointed and you s some way carve up the cost of the third person. But you're absolutely right, Peter. The, the ultimate result is it's a project cost. So it's going to be borne one way or another by the client at the end of the day. Yeah. And I guess that's in line with the fact that um, there is a benefit in appointing the dispute avoidance board, and especially for the client. So I think it makes sense. Well, thanks very much. Um, I think that is all we have time for this morning. And I'd like to thank everyone for coming. And if you have any more questions, send them on to the NEC team and we'll get back to those when we can. A copy of the slides and the recording will be forwarded to you after the conference from the events team. But before we all move on, I just want to make a few points. If you've wanted to learn more about the practical application of NEC, we offer a range of training courses on the contract suite, and you can find more information about it in our website. And to help you more with any training that you need, IC Publishing are offering a 10% discount on NEC publications and to our, our conference delegates. And you can take advantage of that by entering the code NEC Books 10 at the website checkout. So thanks again to all of our speakers. I certainly found them really interesting, really useful, very informative. I'm hoping you can all make it to our afternoon workshop where Peter and more of the DRBF team will have a panel of speakers who will be happy to answer even more questions about the process in more detail. And I'd encourage you to have that discussion. Thank you very much for joining us this morning.